For a long time now, Alberta ratepayers have been complaining about their rising electricity bills. And part of that cost, part of the rising cost, is due to paying for transmission and distribution infrastructure that was built some time ago, and maybe arguably overbuilt. Uh, and so somebody's got to pay the bills, and it turns out it's you and me. But I, there are another way of thinking about this, and I'm going to talk to Professor uh, Sarah Hastings-Simon, from the University of Calgary about that. So welcome to the interview, Sarah. Nice to see you again. Likewise. So look, uh, the transmission lines, we maybe overbuilt those, maybe some of the, the distribution system. Um, how much of that is adding to higher electricity bills for Albertans now? Yeah, so there's definitely a, you know, a significant contribution from the cost of the transmission and distribution system, right? So that when we think about what you pay for electricity um, as a consumer, you're basically paying for the generation of the power. So whether that's in a you know, coal plant, a gas plant, wind or solar, and then you're paying for the wires, you know, the big ones you see along the highways, as well as the small ones you see uh, in neighborhoods or that are underground that bring it to your home. And what's been going on um, in Alberta now is we're really sort of a, a double whammy when it comes to the, the cost side in that we've, we actually had sort of abnormally low prices for generation for a number of years. Um, exactly, actually, and it's sort of comes from the same reason that we had a lot more generation that was built than demand ended up materializing. Um, and because that is a market-based system, then that leads to lower prices. On the transmission and distribution side, we also built out a lot of that infrastructure um, for demand that didn't materialize. And so a smaller pot of demand is really paying for those prices. So the per you know, unit uh, energy use um, is, is higher. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about you know, where that came from. Um, but when you look at the, the sort of long-term outlook that the transmission um, planning was based on in 2014, they were expecting a total demand in 2021 of something like 100,000 gigawatt hours for the year. And what we actually saw in 2021 uh, was closer to 85,000 gigawatt hours. So a pretty big gap between that, you know, 100,000 or 107,000 and actually 85. And so that's a lot of, you know, one way to think of that is sort of this missing load that didn't materialize. And now we're paying for the transmission um, that was built for, for that. We should point out that the Alberta is not the only province dealing with this. I mean, uh, British Columbia, for instance, added more generation, expecting that after the, the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009, that the 2% the growth in demand would resume, and it didn't, it flatlined. And they wound up with all this surplus electricity that they paid very high prices for. Same thing kind of happened in, in Ontario. So the, this is not, uh, it is not uh, unique to Alberta. I, I think there are plenty of utilities in North America made the same mistake. Yeah, that, that's a really important point. You know, that the, there is a sort of decades long now history of overestimation of demand growth. And for a lot of utilities across North America and, and system operators, that really uh, comes from a lot of um, residential and commercial energy efficiency that was not kind of baked into those forecasts. So for example, um, you know, we're lighting our homes now with LEDs, that's actually saving a significant amount of, of electricity. And, and so that kind of, basically, we didn't see as much load growth as we would have otherwise. What happened in Alberta is really a combination of we got some of that energy efficiency savings, but then um, you know the the forecast for the um, for the load growth. And I actually went back recently just to refresh my memory of how that looked. But in the 2014 for a report, for example, um, the ASO was expecting oil sands productions to double over the next decade. So I guess really that, that would have been the 2014 to 2024 time, um, and and through to 2034. Um, and obviously, you know, we are had a lot of things that changed around um, with the with the oil price crash and others. And so a lot of that um, growth didn't materialize. And that's sort of an additional piece of growth that we don't didn't see in Alberta, even more so say than in some of those other regions. Now, you have an interesting argument, and I happen to, I, I agree with this, actually, we, uh, I think it's generally accepted uh, that the, the big the, the energy transition is about switching from fossil fuels to clean abundant cheap electric uh renewables uh and so and we're in the process of electrifying our economies essentially is what so our we're now expecting load growth to begin growing in the in the 2020s uh and 
your argument is that by electrifying more of the Alberta economy, we make better use of that infrastructure that was originally overbuilt. And that actually might bring down the fees that the average ratepayer pays. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, this is something, you know, people have been talking about this for a while that, um, when you are going to have, you know, th there's a concern in some jurisdictions about a need to build out more infrastructure if we're going to electrify a lot of stuff, which is also, you know, possible. But the general idea is that, you know, you're spreading sort of the cost of that infrastructure over more demand as people are electrifying, say, sources of transportation or um, home heating. And that really just, you know, creates more demand that can pay for those uh, transmission infrastructure. And I think it's, you know, within Alberta, where we've already made those investments, having more of that electricity demand that's coming from, you know, smart electrification, and we want to be careful about that. It's not about let's just, you know, start creating a bunch of new demand um, for, you know, that that's sort of more than we really need, but smart electrification, um, you know, thinking about things like combining it with the energy efficiency and making sure that we're thinking about how to, uh, you know, control time of use and others, um, I think is, is one of, you know, the bit main solutions around the transmission uh, investments that we've already made, right? And looking forward, there's other things that we should be doing, again, thinking about how do we avoid the need for new transmission infrastructure. Um, but when it comes to sort of the, the past investments that have been already made, you know, I think by some measure, you could say that, you know, increasing load is really one of the only things that, that one could possibly do to, to sort of address those, that component of the rising costs. And I want to make an argument here and see what you think about it for managing this process instead of letting it develop willy nilly. Uh, because I, last year, ASO, the Alberta Electrical System Operator, put out a report about the state of the grid and, and modernization of it. And one of the big concerns from utilities is that they're going to see the trend arrive in Alberta that you see in other, in particular in, in the United States, of big commercial and industrial users self generating that they, put, they use solar and, and maybe wind to a smaller extent to essentially, if not disconnect themselves from the grid, at least reduce the amount of power that they're drawing from the grid. And then of course, that's a big revenue loss to, to the utilities. And it, I think that argues for maybe more of a managed process. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I mean, there's, again, there's some subtle differences that actually I think are important in how that might play out, right? And so some of the rules around um, distributed generation and self-generation, um, the way that they are in Alberta are already sort of sort of shifting in the US, let's say, as there are as rising penetration of solar, there's a concern by some that costs are being shifted from um, solar generators, those that have that, let's say, on the rooftop um, to others that don't. The, the structure that we have already within Alberta sort of protects against that. We're actually already undercompensating them. So, so there's sort of some, some more room there. So in some sense, some of those challenges I think we may face later. Um, but there is, you know, there, there's just a lot of moving pieces in this in this transition, um, which is not to say that we shouldn't make the transition. You know, we know that we need to, but indeed thinking about how to, if not directly control them, um, you know, and I think the idea that we could perfectly plan out how this all goes, you know, that that's probably a little bit. Um, uh, overly ambitious, but really thinking about what are, you know, where do we want to end up and what are generally the, the you know, sort of structures that we can create to encourage things to happen in a way um, that makes sense, I think is an important part of that, right? And so, um, you know, for example, if we are going to bring on enough, a bunch of new load through electrification, um, really making sure that we bring that load on in a way that it is already coming on um, and, and more, you know, controllable, that it can come at times of day when we have more electricity and it can uh, ramp down at other times that we don't, um, you know, and, and that's a lot easier to do when you have a few big load sources like electric cars or like heating, um, where, you know, on the heating side, for example, if you're electrifying heating, you can do, you know, short term heat storage over a day so that you're basically not sort of heating on demand you're building, but you're generating that heat at time when you're generating a lot of renewable energy and, and reducing it at other times. And it's really, you know, I think it's, it's all part of 
sort of a paradigm shift actually in how we think about the grid. You know, we're, we're moving from this old system where we have these big centralized generation. It's very dispatchable, meaning we can turn it on and off when we want to, um, but the load is very sort of, it just is what it is and the system is responding to that. And now you can imagine this future, we have very high penetration of renewable energy. We actually have, you know, the cost of generation then, certainly the, the, um, the operation costs of, of generation is very low, you know, essentially zero, but you have this upfront cost um, that, that is overall still lower than the, the current system. But then you're having to put more spend into uh, the transmission infrastructure and more spend into, you know, controlling that load. And so, so many of the kind of rules of thumb and the ways that we think about doing things that work really well with the system that we have today are not going to work in the future. And we're starting to run into that and in, in seeing that, um, you know, things like time of use pricing or ways that, that encourages consumers to charge their car at the right time. Um, that's missing from our system today. Yeah, I think I'm struck by the extent to which the Americans in particular, now the Europeans as well, are grappling, publicly grappling with these kinds of issues. There's a conversation around it that we're not having in Canada, and particularly in, El in Alberta. So I want to ask you, what kind of, ch of regulatory changes and policy changes from the provincial government are required to help address the issue we're talking about and also help the electricity system transition from this 20th century model, basically, you talked about, to this new 21st century model. Yeah, so there's there's sort of two types of things I think the government can and should do, right? And so one is really setting an overall direction for the electricity system. And so, you know, we have a regulator, the, the Alberta Utilities Regulator, and the commission that, that oversees that system. And they really have a mandate that's about ensuring reliability and cost, right? And, and climate is somewhere there, but it's not it's not front and center. And, and that I think is an important missing piece. And you could say, well, on the cost side, it should come in. And if this stuff is gonna be cheaper, it should be there anyway. But I think being more explicit about where we're heading, which is a system that we need to be reliable and affordable, but also zero carbon and, and really baking that into the mandate of, um, of the utility regulator would be key. Um, and then that trickles down into, you know, there's, there's way too many different things that need to happen to then to, we can go through on this, uh, on this conversation now, but, you know, just to point out another one on the transmission side, um, the way that the transmission system in Alberta works, um, when you want to connect to, if you have say two generators, you want to connect to the same sort of point on the grid. Um, the, the rules say, well, you have to think about what would happen if those are both generating at the same time, right? And, and if that's more than the system can take, then you can't do that. Now, that makes a lot of sense if you have two dispatchable generators. If you have a, um, a, wind, uh, a wind farm and a battery storage, which you know, operates part of its time as a generator, that makes very little sense because almost by definition, um, those two sources are never going to be generating at the same time. You know, either you're going to have a lot of wind in the province, in which case storage is going to be, uh, be charging, or you're not going to have that wind, in which case you'd be using your storage. And so the rules that we have, which, you know, make perfect sense under the, the, the sort of previous version of the electricity system, include a lot of these sort of, you know, shortcuts or, or sort of you know, you can think about them when they're applied. Also, sometimes it's that it's that intuition that we um, develop around a system where you know that this rule works in order to achieve what you're really trying to achieve, which is avoiding you know congestion on the system. But it no longer makes sense with this new set of resources that we have. And so there is throughout the the energy system, throughout the electricity system, a bunch of rules like this that that really we need to go back and look at them and say, well, what are we really trying to achieve from a first principle? And now does this rule actually make sense given the change in the type of resources that we have, or do we need to think about this differently? Um, and that's challenging, not so much from a technological perspective, right? We, we have these technologies and not even from a you know, the rule actually, we could change it and, and we could achieve the thing that we're trying to achieve. But it's a lot of work within a system that hasn't changed in, you know, practically a century, um, because the technology, you know, the fundamental technology for generating and distributing electricity, while it has changed in some ways, and we may have switched fuel sources, um, the, you know, the sort of underlying inherent rules that govern it haven't changed in a way that they are changing now. Well, Sarah, if I could sum up, it's, it's to get back to this idea of 
we're switching from a 20th century model to a 21st century electricity system and utility model, regulatory model. And for viewers who are watching this and wondering what that means for their for their uh, their power bill, the if we do this in a smart way, the opportunity is there to reduce those costs. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and it's sort of this idea that you know it's not a it's not. A, I can only think of the French gagner d'avance. It's not, it's not sort of already set about whether or not we're going to come out ahead or behind in costs in this transition. And if we're smart about it and you know do electrification in a smart way, there are really good ways that it can reduce costs. If we do it in a you know simplistic or not so smart way, we may increase them. And so you know it's important that we're that we're doing the former rather than the latter. Um, and along the same time, you know, again, other things that we need to be thinking more about on, on energy efficiency and electricity affordability and, and a lot of different issues that kind of all come together. But I think by putting them all together, then we have more of a chance to solve them really at the root of the issue and, and take care of these different elements rather than trying to sort of parcel them out separately and saying, well, let's just look at this one specific case. We really need to go back to you know, the first principles for our, for our electricity system and make sure that we have the right rules in place for that future we're trying to build. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Yeah, happy to talk.